So the story of Captain William Albrecht, a Vietnam uh, veteran and Green Beret, came to us uh, because it was really so heroic and so noteworthy. Uh, it resulted in saving of, of 150 men's lives in the midst of a, a pretty heated battle in the Cambodian border. And people even now, uh, almost 50 years later, are really advocating for him to get a higher medal, a higher honor than what he got, which was the Silver Star Medal. Uh, there's some reviews going on with folks and they're trying to push it up the, the chain really to get a further review, maybe get the president to look at uh, his actions in 1969 and see if that Silver Star Medal should be upgraded to a Medal of Honor. So the story of the actions of Captain Albrecht that did lead to the medal that, that he received uh, are basically Hollywood worthy. Um, there was a small documentary made and a book written about it. Escape from Firebase Kate. We're in Vietnam in 1969. What is called Vietnamization is starting, where they're really trying to turn the war over to the South Vietnamese to fight the North Vietnamese, rather than having uh, the Americans at the front of the front lines. Uh, but still, the Americans are providing crucial support. So there's this, a, a firebase called Firebase Kate. It's a very small outpost on a hilltop, basically artillery, just to kind of provide some fire support for uh, South Vietnamese units in the area when they're conducting operations. In late October 1969, uh, then Captain Green Beret William Albrecht steps off a helicopter to meet about 150 Montgard troops and uh, around two dozen American soldiers, primarily artillerymen. Uh, they really don't have any infantry training. In fact, they will admit in some later interviews that they were kind of hanging out, really, really partying, playing volleyball on the hilltop because nothing was going on. And all that was about to change very quickly. So almost immediately, Captain Albrecht gets on that hilltop and he realizes that things are just not up to, uh, up to snuff. Uh, he, he gets folks, you know, filling sandbags, repositioning their guns. Um, he realizes this place is vulnerable and he would attack it if he were the enemy. So they really start strengthening those defenses and pretty much in the nick of time. First contact with the enemy that night was the beginning of a siege on the firebase that would escalate rapidly over the next three days. But the size of the enemy force in the surrounding jungle was unclear. We didn't know we were against, up against a couple of regiments of North Vietnamese Army regulars that had come down from, from the north on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Not Viet Cong shooting their mortars and running away. These were hardcore NVA soldiers, and five or 6,000 of them that were trying to surround us. So they're doing all this work to do the defenses, the attack starts coming, they start to realize slowly over time how big this attack is and they're going to get overrun. So they're calling for non-stop air support. Spooky for one, this attack. Hey, Roger, buddy. Hey, uh, old lady up here is ready to clear her throat and do a little talking for you. Okay, we're going fine. Tell you what, uh, let's put it to the uh, echo, to the echo of our local... Uh, the echo and uh, work it on up to the uh, November Echo. Okay, we're coming in hot. Okay, I'm gonna go on reserve. So where this young captain starts to shine is when another officer is killed and he has to take over all of the command. He's leading patrols himself as a captain, sometimes taking point out into the, the jungle to try to find the enemy and then also calling in very close air support uh, in a time when there were no satellite guided munitions, uh, people were going off terrain features and just bombing on grid locations from map and compasses. He's guiding those bombs in very close to his own position, to his own troops, um, but trying to protect them because the enemy is advancing. Uh, roger, roger on that. Okay, uh... Walk it right in the wood line there, right in the wood line if you can. Okay, now uh, all your friendlies are inside your uh, perimeter there except the ones uh, to the November Whiskey. Is that Charlie? Uh, that is an indefinite affirmative. Hawk, this is 4-1. We're just going to start working all the way around you, babe. Okay, buddy, that sounds real good, real good. Go ahead. They run out of water, they run out of ammo, they're reaching really their wits end. So after about five days of, of receiving, you know, random indirect fire and direct fire from pretty much all sides uh, by these regiments, they decide they've got to go. They go through pitch blackness, they have complete light discipline, they can make no noise, no sound. At one point, um, they get some fire, they think they're taking friendly fire from their own um, air support. Get to a clearing where there's really no communication. They had to take. They took a, a wrong turn on a pathway to get to link up with their own friendly forces. And Captain Albrecht himself has to walk out in this empty pasture in open open territory in moonlight, which is a no, no. You never ever do that. It's like it's like infantry 101. He, but he has to do it just to show the friendly forces on the other side that they're friendly and they're not going to get shot up by their own guys as they finally link up with the support that they've been waiting for for five days. And he does, of course, and he gets them out and and the men survive and. There's, you know, nearly, nearly uh, 150 uh, men and another uh, two dozen you know, Americans that, that lived because of that. 
We got to Boo Prying that morning about 11.30 in the morning. We walked all night, it wasn't that far, but again, we, we took the most surreptitious and the most camouflaged routes we could, we could ever uh, imagine. Back on Kate, spooky gunships and B-52 bombers made sure nothing remained on the abandoned fire base. As we left, uh, I recall Spooky saying that, that there were guys coming up the other side and that they were all over the place and then they started strafing the fire base behind us. Uh, the Air Force the next day sent in B-52 bombers and dropped 2,000 pound bombs on the top of Cape and they just blew the hilltop away. 